Hey, good morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, squeezing into this room. Uh, this is kind of a, a little bit of a humbling experience to talk to such a group of uh, talented photographers. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit this morning about my work, show you a few pictures from the past few years, and hopefully inspire some of you to maybe take a risk or two with your career down the road. I'm going to talk a little bit about how one image changed the course of my career. There should be time at the end of this for questions, so please, uh, uh, if you have any, please keep them and remember them when we get going here at the end. So this was something that was shared with me early on in my career, and it, uh, it, 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 it's kept me humble ever since. So, but just, yeah, think about this. So I titled this talk A Career in Three Acts, and as I'm beginning my 43rd year of postgraduate work, uh, just like the title says, my professional life has played out in three acts. The first was newspapers. The second was with magazines, Auto Week magazine in particular. And this car here is the Exner XNR, which was designed by Virgil Exner, who on Friday, you guys, I think some of you are going to go to the Studebaker Museum. Virgil Exner was the chief designer of Studebaker. So. And then, of course, higher education, which is where I'm at now. So don't, don't ask me which, which career portion has been my favorite. So maybe by the end of this talk, you'll be able to discern for yourself. But each has been interesting and rewarding. The experience and lessons learned have been like building blocks that's been paving the path for my next adventure. When discussing my career path today, I hope you are encouraged to, at some point in your career, if given the opportunity, to step out of your comfort zone and take a managerial role where your visual literacy can be used to help shape the direction of your college or university. Visuals will continue to play an increasingly vital role in news, marketing, and information at your school. And unfortunately, many of us know all too well what it's like to work for a, a visually illiterate boss. I'll talk a little bit more on that later. So like an increasing number of members of this organization, I got my start in photography working in a newspaper, first in college at Central Michigan Life, which after like, I graduated in 1980, and I would say that it still remains one of the most professional places I've ever worked. I don't know if that says it's good or bad. I don't know what that is. But. So yeah, shooting news and, of course, sports in college. And then after graduation, I went to a small weekly newspaper in Michigan's beautiful thumb area. And yeah, that's what they call it. If you're from Michigan, you carry around a map. So the thumb area is what to call it. So it's really a gift. So when I left college, I really didn't want to go to a weekly newspaper. I thought I was going to be able to step right into a, a big city daily. And if you remember in 1980, it was post Watergate where a big city newspaper really changed the course of the world. And I really wanted some of that. I thought I should be able to walk in and just get a job. But it wasn't to be. And if you look at your history books in 1980, the country was in a pretty good recession. Unemployment at Michigan at that time was 20 plus percent. So just getting a job was lucky. So, but I did get this job at the advertiser and we had a few Washington bigwigs come through and it was fun to, uh, to be able to photograph this. I don't think I've ever been able to since get a photograph of a president using a 24 millimeter lens. So never gotten that close again. Yeah, so the first and only job I did get was from Carol, and I didn't, like I said, I didn't really want to be there, but it turned out to be exactly what I needed, and starting out early in my career, I was shooting a lot of stuff, and I joined a staff that at the time was the best weekly newspaper in the state, and I was photographing everything, news, features, sports, portraits, four, five, six assignments a day. The police dispatcher had my home telephone number, and I'd get calls after hours for car accidents and fires, even murders and suicides. And for a small rural area, it really had a lot of spot news. I mean, prisoners escaping, it was just lots of fun. And during that time, I met some amazing people. And despite the long hours, 60, 70 hours a week, I think some people here can relate to that, the low pay, I really loved it. I was learning how to be a photographer, 
how to adapt to a variety of different professional situations, and I was learning how to communicate with people, which I think is probably the most important thing we do as a photographer. And let me just repeat that. Communication is really key to what we all do. I didn't think, I don't think this is something that can be easily taught, this communication that, that allows you to, to really get so close to people, but it's something that can be learned by repeatedly being put into these situations where you use those skills. You need to be able to make people comfortable in front of your camera, and you also need to be able to talk your way into some situations in order to get the picture. And speaking of art, back then I lived for wild art. Now this really isn't a, a real term, I kind of made this up, but I've always thought about feature photos for newspapers like this as the uncommon view of the commonplace. And the paper loved these kinds of images. Designers love vertical pictures too, by the way. <laughs> I had to come up with a feature, front page feature, once a week. It uh, wasn't that hard. Drove around a lot, saw a lot of interesting things. And really tried to add humor whenever I could. It was about this time that I started doing some freelance work for the Associated Press. <clears throat> a photographer friend said the AP needed a, a group of photographers to staff an IndyCar race at, at Michigan International Speedway. And MIS is about 45 minutes from where I grew up. And I was living much, much further away then. So I thought it'd be a fun time to go home and see my parents and, and then photograph a big time car race. So I'd been into cars when I was young, did some street racing as a rebellious teenager and had been to MIS a few times with my dad and uncles, so it seemed like a great idea. So in July of 81, I joined a crew of about a dozen photographers for the first Michigan 500. This was pretty exciting stuff. During the pre-race meeting, rolls of fresh, factory-loaded film were handed out. Not everybody in the room knows fresh, factory-loaded film, but it was a big deal because we were bulk-loading film back then to do anything to save money. But so getting factory loaded film and be able to open those boxes and load your cameras, it was really pretty special. Also at that meeting, two-way radios were handed out. And the AP photo editor said when you exposed your film, if there was something that happened, there was going to be a couple of guys on bikes that would drive by and pick up your film and bring it back to the darkroom, which was set up in a, a trailer in the infield. So as a rookie, I didn't get a very glamorous assignment that first weekend. I was sent out to try to talk my way on top of an RV in turn three. And if there was a crash, to shoot it. And if any other newspaper features, to shoot those too. But don't waste film. Don't take selfies. Don't, don't ship anything that wasn't going to be in a newspaper. And the last thing that I was told was, don't waste film. So a van took me out to the turn. I talked my way up on top of this RV. Had a couple of beers with these guys. I agreed to make a picture of them and uh, had a great time and, and thought it was really going to be, you know, it was, I was waiting for the race to start. And then it started raining. And it rained and it rained. And it rained some more until they postponed the race until the next Saturday. So not knowing it at the time, but that July thunderstorm was probably one of the biggest breaks in my career. More than half of the AP crew that <coughs> were there for the first weekend couldn't make it for the second weekend. And they needed somebody to go on top of the press box to cover a situation like this in case it happened because the previous May in Indianapolis there was a pit fire and the AP didn't get any photos. They, they didn't have a vantage point looking down on, on the pit area. So I climbed to the top of the press box and they had this 800 millimeter lens that was a Canon lens that had been converted to a Nikon mount and it had a little telescoping uh, like focusing wheel on the side of it. it. The thing looked like it was built by Frankenstein. So on lap 30 <clears throat> a fire did break out, and this is a safety worker that's dousing the flames on driver Herm Johnson. And if you go back, we'll go back to this slide, if you, that's, the hero image there is frame 33. So I was about three quarters of a second from running out of film. Luck was on my side that day. So, <clears throat> because this race is being run on a Saturday afternoon on East Coast time, the photo of Johnson was used in the next day in Sunday papers across the country, including A1 of the Detroit Free Press with a byline, which was unusual back in the day, and even a little bit bigger in the Sunday Detroit News on uh, Section A1 of the sports section. 
both those newspapers had photographers there. So it was always fun when you worked for the AP when you were getting a, a picture placement like that over the staff people who were there. Also, just to give you a little perspective of the, of the time, the Detroit News was over 300 pages that Sunday. Talk about hitting a, a thud when it hit your porch. So the weekly play report, which was a scorecard the AP kept um, to see where the images were used, it showed that every AP member that had a Sunday paper used this picture. That didn't happen very often back in the days when AP and UPI were battling it out. They called that a home run, and it got the attention of photo editors in New York. And so with one image, I became a racing photographer. And it eventually opened a few other doors as well. I don't know if things are the same today. I don't know if one picture like this could make that sort of an impact. I don't know if it has the reach, the, the way newspapers did back in the day. But back then it did. And <clears throat> early 80s, there was a downward spiraling economy. I was laid off from the photo job in Cairo. And uh, my wife of just four months had a job prospect in Ann Arbor, so we moved to Ann Arbor. And I started freelancing for the AP and shooting a lot of sports and eventually got a uh, full-time temporary job when the photo editor was assigned um, out of the country. So it was lots of sports, professional sports. I love shooting baseball. Uh, Tiger games were, um, I mean, I did 40 one summer, and uh, as a former baseball player, I loved I thought I would love being there, but after 40 games, it's, it's pretty, pretty tough to come up with an interesting picture. But of all the baseball pictures I've ever shot, this is my favorite. And then, and again, I don't know if Derek's here from MSU, but this, this is Bo Schembechler, legendary Michigan coach Bo Schembechler getting his 100th win in Spartan Stadium. And I was back on top of the press box again for another pit fire, but not quite as dramatic as, as the first one. That press box made for a nice vantage point for an A.J. Foyt crash, which again got a lot of play, again because it's a vertical picture. And also that picture of Ricky Henderson, I saw it in print a lot. It was always cropped down to like a one or two column picture, of course. So covering the last race of the season in 82, the sports editor from my old hometown newspaper in Adrian said, the paper was looking to hire a photographer. And I just had a temp job with the AP, so I applied and, and got it. And if you catch me sometime later over a beer, I'll tell you the interview process for that job. It was, it, it's an interesting story. I spent 15 years as a news photographer in Adrian. Uh, I had some opportunities to move, but it, uh, I liked what I was doing, so I stayed. And the newspaper went from all black and white to color. And you know, even in the dark room, I was wearing a tie. I was back to making a lot of wild art. I climbed up to a 110-foot uh, green elevator to get a picture of this crop duster. And I was always looking for that uncommon view of the commonplace. A water skier in November, and a construction crew framing up a building. News and features, just like uh, back at the weekly paper, but on a daily basis, and sometimes in the same day. And I always like to. Whenever I could find humor, I, I, I really went for it. Again, looking for different angles. Too bad the picture on the right isn't in color. You could see Paul Newman's blue eyes. And then when the paper went to color, it, it, it added an element to, to uh, our photography, what we were able to do. And sometimes it was not so great when we had the bad lighting of sports, but we still had to push through and do it. So it's important to note during this time what was going on in mid-90s technology-wise. This was the beginning of the turn to digital photography. And for our newspaper, the first introduction was the Leaf Picture Desk. And this was uh, every AP member got one of these machines. And uh, they called it a digital darkroom. And it was really a game changer for papers all across the country. We could stop making prints in the darkroom. We still had to shoot film. And we'd scan it in, into a... We had a leaf scanner. There were other scanners you could use, but we used a leaf scanner. And that's how images were then, then uh, produced. Uh, at our paper, we used a, uh, an output device called an Autocon, which was this, I don't know who dreamed this thing up, but it was amazing, a bunch of lasers. And it was really amazing technology for the time when you consider going from 
just a couple years earlier, we were all black and white. And then being able to do all this and make color separations in-house. Still working at the Telegram, but I was also freelancing for the AP. I did the Tigers and Lions and Red Wings, MSU, U of M, and of course, a lot of racing. Formula One came to Detroit in 1982, and because of my title as a racing photographer, I got, uh, I got a pretty good assignment. I was in the pit area for, uh, for two days, for those seven years. And then I was in this tower on turn one, looking down that straightaway right next to the Detroit River to frame it with the Renaissance Center in the background. These were really long, hard days, but uh, I really loved it. And for whatever reason, in, in the, the mid-90s, the uh, <coughs> newspaper publisher saw something in me that I don't know that I really saw in myself at the time. And he told me that he saw the way I adapted to the quickly changing technology, how I dealt with people in the newsroom, how I dealt with people in the community, and how the people on the staff listened to me. And he said, you know, I want you to become the editor. The photography, color photography was taking a, playing a larger role in the newspaper and, and I was having a, a, a impact on that and selecting pictures and shooting a lot of the pictures and, and uh, he saw how the circulation would jump anytime we had a good bright color photo on top of the, uh, the front page. So the longtime editor left and the publisher said the job's yours. And I, I, he said I know I could do it, but I sure wasn't sure. I mean, this was a daily newspaper, and I really loved being a photographer. So I was stunned, certainly flattered, and, and quite a bit scared. Running a daily newspaper is way, way different than being a photographer in a daily newspaper. It's a huge difference in responsibility, in stress, in headaches, in calls at home at night from people whose children's names were misspelled in the honor roll. You know, all sorts of fun stuff. Plus, I had to manage a staff of, of 20 plus people. So after a few days, I came back to him and I said, I'd take it if I could get some training. He said, no problem. So I went to the Pointer Institute in Florida for a few classes and the Middle School of Journalism at Northwestern. So looking back on this, I, I really wasn't seeking the editor's job because writers ruled the world back then. They became editors, not photographers. And it, it, it really wasn't common for a photographer to sort of move up the ladder in the newspaper world. But a couple of things were in play here. And it almost seems laughable, but I wore a tie every day to work. For whatever reason, that's, that kind of set a, that sent a message, at least to the publisher. If you notice, I mean, here I'm wearing a tie, and you go back a few pictures. Uh, even the first one that showed, uh, I was shooting a soccer game, you know, outdoors in the rain. And I had a tie on. I look back on that and I go, oh, what was I doing? But. <laughs> and the technology was really changing rapidly, and I was, I was staying ahead of that. You know, we, we talked about, uh, it got to a point where we were talking more about computers than we were talking about cameras, which was you know, kind of interesting. And the publisher thought that I was really somebody that could move the paper into the future. So... And one of the things I think that happened was, in the early 80s, I went to a National Press Photographer's flying short course. And one of the photographers who was there said, you know, you guys got to get out of the darkroom. You need to get in the newsroom. That's where the decisions are being made. Get into the newsroom. So, and I did that. One of the first things I did when I got to Adrian, I said, can I get a desk in the newsroom? And they said, sure. So I settled into running a newspaper. I still shot a few sporting events. And I was able to lead the paper through another technology change, which was the digital camera. And yeah, we bought a couple of those DSC Kodak things that were, you look back on it today, you go, how'd this ever work? They were $17,000 a piece back then. And we were spending about $50,000 a year on film and chemistry. That's about $100,000 in today's money if you, for inflation. So if you think about you know, a couple of digital cameras, that erases your, your film and chemistry costs. And one of the first things I learned as a newspaper editor was learning how to read a spreadsheet. Because 
some of my bonus money was attached to making sure that spreadsheet balanced at the end of the year. So, so I edited a newspaper about five years. I worked to redesign the paper, and it won several Society of News Design Awards for a paper our size. And this here is actually a picture of the, the first press run of that redesign. So then in December of 99, I had two weeks of vacation that I was going to lose if I didn't take it. And I'm sitting at home, nothing to do, and I see automotive news there. My wife worked for a research group with the automotive industry. I pick it up. There's an advertisement for the, they needed a managing editor at, at Auto Week magazine. And I had been a reader of Auto Week for quite a while. And I, I loved it. So thinking I'd edit a small town newspaper until I retired, I took another big risk and got out of my comfort zone again and applied for this job. And again, much to my amazement, uh, I got it. I was now editing a national magazine, traveling the world, driving cars, writing stories, and occasionally taking pictures. Sometimes taking pictures and writing the story. And this is one of my favorite boondoggles of all time because I'm a golfer. Scotty Cameron's a legend with putters. He's also a car guy, and I somehow was able to tie it all together. And it was, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact I actually got to do that. So my job description at Auto Week said nothing about photography, but because I enjoyed it so much and I was in situations where I could shoot racing still, I did, but most of, the, uh, I would say 95% of all the photography in the magazine was done by freelancers. And um, occasionally I would get the opportunity to shoot, shoot some racing. So in, again, thinking back to the technology of the time, in 2000 we were still using slide film. Digital cameras were in newsrooms, but we couldn't, the digital cameras just didn't have enough bandwidth for, for cover shots. And on my drive into the Auto Week office, I drove past Metro Airport. And on Monday mornings, I would stop by the North, Northwest Airlines at that time freight terminal and pick up a box or two of film that had been shipped from photographers who were working for us in Japan or in, in Asia, in Europe. And I dropped the film off at, at a lab downtown Detroit. A couple hours later, we'd get the chromes. And I worked with the art director a lot to, to select images for the magazine. And again, I, was, I felt like I was acting as, a, as an advocate for photographers and for photography play in the magazine. It was about 2004 until we ran our first digital cover, so it took a while. So during the time at Auto Week, I kept seeing these books come in looking for reviews, and some were good and some were bad. But I kept seeing these books from this publisher in Phoenix called David Bull Publishing, and they were mostly photo books that were beautifully designed and printed. I, I had a thought. I had about 125 rolls of film from the F1 days in Detroit, and I wondered if I could find a book in there. So I spent a couple of months going through the negatives. Most of them were still in, in the film bags, and I don't know if you've ever, if you guys ever remember seeing a film bag. This is a, this is a film bag we use for the AP. You take your roll of film, write your notes on it. Uh, there's no twin check on this one, but a lot of times it was twin checks, you know, a sticker on the film and on the bag so it could match up to what was going on. So I, I scanned about 140 negatives and had prints made and sent them off with a proposal, and much to my amazement, he liked the idea. So Postcards from Detroit was born. It was published in 2006. Um, 5,000 copies were printed. I have 13 copies left in, at home. And again, look back on it, it was because of that, that rainstorm in July as a racing photographer. So driving cars, writing about cars, sometimes taking pictures of cars, and sometimes being a test driver was all part of my work life. And it was a million miles away from those first days in a newspaper. There were some perks to the job, like driving a new Ferrari in Sicily. But after a million and a half flight miles, several hundred hotel nights, and some pretty amazing experience, the changes in the publishing world again, brought on primarily by the internet, ended one dream job. And then I got another dream job. From some, some friends, I heard that there was an opening at the University of Michigan, and maybe my skill set would be appropriate. 
So I applied, and after going through the most rigorous interviewing process I've ever gone through, I got the job. So all those experiences in newsroom, the newspapers, at the AP, at Auto Week, they come into the play, come into play now in the role I have as director of Michigan Photography and the video group Michigan Media. I still make a few pictures, sports pictures mostly because that's what I like to do, and I really like baseball and softball. And I enjoy working as a second photographer at events where I don't need to be taking the main action photos. We're lucky we have some great photographers that take great action photos. And, and, but it's fun to sort of be on the periphery and, and, and try to find these little quiet moments. And you know, it's very easy to get cynical about big time college athletics, but there are some really special moments if you're, if you're around and you're patient. I'm always looking for that uncommon view of the commonplace and on brand. And just days after the tragic shooting of Michigan State University campus, I was very proud of our university's response when we hosted MSU for a men's basketball game. Turning the arena green in recognition of the Spartan tragedy was really a, a moving moment. And I was very happy I was able to be there. Having a successful football team opens up a lot of nice photo opportunities. And getting the head coach smiling after beating in-state rival is a, is a highlight. And even though these are highly talented and now they're pretty highly compensated athletes, they're still at heart just, you know, 19, 18, 19, 20 year old kids. Capturing that emotion really takes me back to why I first fell in love with photography. And even when we lose, it's important for us as documentarians to, to try to capture that emotion. This was a tough one this past uh, January. We get great flyovers at nearly all of our home games and trying to come up with a different angle is take some creative positioning and we actually talk quite a bit about it, about how we're gonna try to get it with the team that we have covering each game. We always try to find a block M somewhere. And emotion is really what keeps me engaged in shooting sports. That and trying to get peak action. It's another game at MSU, sorry Derek. And so is this. This is one of my favorite action photos from a few years back. And the crowd storming the field after beating Ohio State for the first time in many years is another highlight of my time at Michigan. I've also been able to do a couple of, of international trips, which has allowed me to do some documentary photography. And that, that's kind of fun because I, I've been able to get back to some of the roots, and some long form stories. So in each, each international trip, I, uh, I know uh, listening to John White last night, he, he said he liked to get up in the morning and, and I've kind of done the same thing. Try to get up and, and take a walk through whatever community I was in to try to get the sights and, and the sounds and the feel of whatever city we're in. I was able to do this in Cuba a few years ago with some music students and really getting absorbed the car, car, car culture in Havana was really a lot of fun. So again, photography is not my main focus uh, as being a photographer. It's, it's more important that I need to be at staff meetings and advocating for our office. It's still fun though. I've also tried to keep up with technology. We started doing some drone photography um, prior to the pandemic and was able to do quite a bit of that. So that's been a lot of fun to learn. And then it does really look like a big house from the drone from a couple years ago. And so make no mistake, this, this really is another dream job for me. Uh, really have a fantastic staff of good, talented people to work with. We're at one of the best universities in the world. We have interesting work to do and our clients and most of our bosses really appreciate what we do. Now earlier I talked about visually illiterate bosses. You know the type. You give them the choice of two Pulitzer Prize winners and an out of focus snapshot and they're gonna choose the out of focus snapshot every time. <laughs> and they say it, well it fits my layout better. I hope you don't have a boss like that, 
but please just don't give them that bad picture if you can help it. If you're interested in becoming a visual leader, I suggest a couple of things. Be engaged when dealing with your superiors. Be forward thinking. Stay on top of new technology. Look for opportunities to bridge departments and always stay curious. Earlier in my career, I could not have imagined the things I've done, the people I've been able to meet and the places I've gone, and the dozens of people I've hired and been able to coach and help get on their career. And it's all because I took a risk. So if I'd flamed out as an editor, I would have been out of a job and trying to get another photo job somewhere. There's nothing wrong with staying a photographer. There would have been nothing wrong with it at all. I loved it. It was really my first dream job. And having a camera in my hand, just like what John White was talking about last night, it's given me a front row ticket to really an amazing life. But I took a chance on a career path that I was frankly pretty scared to take at the time. But to paraphrase Robert Frost, and that has made all the difference. If you're given a chance to take a different path, I encourage you to explore it. Thank you for your time. That's a very tough situation to be in if you can't see what the next steps are. And, and I know that a lot of organizations at U of M, they, they do try to, to say, um, look at what a career path might look like. What are your goals? That's what we're supposed to do as managers when we do reviews, to say what, what's next for you. And, and a lot of times, it's not in that department anymore. It would be moving on to something else. Because again, if, if you're in a photo department, you need photographers. So what happens if you want, you know, the next advancement would be out of the office, essentially. So it, that's a very difficult situation, especially in, in positions like this. And yeah, I don't know what to tell you other than to go in and, and look at what other possibilities, what jobs you'd like to have. And maybe it's not being a photographer. I don't know. Yeah, that's part of it. You, you do move up with responsibility. You, you go from senior photographer to assistant director, photographer, photography, and then hopefully director. You could also move into a marketing position. My, my job is actually at the university is actually a marketing job. So, um, and we, we are, our office is part of the marketing department at, at the University of Michigan. I don't know, uh, some, some are in, in news and information, but we're in marketing. So, if there, there would be possibilities to move up in, in marketing because of that, but the job would not be necessarily all be about photography. It would be, it would be another path. That was the hardest part about moving up when I was at the newspaper. And, but one of the nice things when you're a boss, you can do what you want. <laughs> right? It just means, it, it, you know, when I was taking pictures at the newspaper, it would be after working a 60 hour week and then I would say, well, I'll shoot the college football game on Saturday. Or I'll, I'll go to the race and I'll work the weekend. And you have to have, for me, I had to have a very understanding wife who knew that I, I needed that kind of creative outlet and I needed to do that. And, the job that I'm in now, uh, the previous person was not a photographer who had it. She was an administrator. And um, so when I came in, I just said that I would, I wanted to try to, to integrate myself into the team that was there, the photography team. And, uh, and I needed to do it too. I, I, you know, for myself, I needed to do it. And the other nice thing is that the way our, we're a chargeback unit. So if, if I'm taking, if I'm doing a photo job, then the income is not, you know, it's, it's like overtime, I don't get paid overtime, but if I have to hire, if we have to bring in another photographer, then they would have overtime, and, or they, scheduling wise. So part of it initially for me was looking out for the office. I could say that, and it was true. Um, I could tell my bosses that, but the, um, the bottom line is I really, uh, I enjoy it and I didn't want to give it up completely. So, but having said that, I don't want to do it day in and day out. I'm, that's in my rearview mirror. 
Yeah, the, the number one thing that, that and I, I had this in the, the, the talk and I, uh, for some reason I, I kind of skipped over it, but everybody here, one of the biggest things about being a leader is making decisions and being able to make a decision. And as photographers, you're, you're making dozens of decisions every day and you're doing it under pressure. And that's what leaders have to do. Um, the worst boss in the world is somebody that just kind of hems and haws and doesn't give you an answer. Yeah. I mean, give me an answer. I don't care if it's wrong, but give me an answer. I, I, I need to move on. You know, let's go. So that's the number one thing that I, I think that I, I learned relatively early on was that making decisions came easy to me. And if, if I messed it up, if it was the wrong decision, it came back to me. And then I made the right one after that. So I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of failing. And I think part of that was having the support of a boss who you know, I didn't think I belonged in the job anyway. So, so if I mess it up, it's not on me, it's on him. <laughs> and then the other thing that I, I learned early on was um, if you have five people on your staff or six people or 10 people or 20 people, you need to learn how to motivate and congratulate and encourage each one of those because they're all individual, they're different. And the one person that wants to be singled out and enjoy the admiration of their colleagues at a staff meeting, the other one, if you do that too, he's, he's going to punch you in the alley. You know? <laughs> he doesn't want it or they don't want it. So learning that, and, and I learned that lesson uh, at my first staff meeting when I became editor. And I, I'll also say that being promoted up through an organization to become a leader when you were a colleague with the people that all of a sudden you not then have to boss around, that's really hard. And I. It happens, and it would, you know, and you can get over it, you can get through it, but that's really hard. You know, people you were drinking beer with and, you know, yucking it up two weeks before, and all of a sudden you're, you know, chastising them for having too much overtime or whatever, you know, and they're looking at it, they go, really? <laughs> you know, this is how you are now? It's like, well, yeah, this is how I got to be, so, yeah. But I do think being a photographer is, is great training ground because, again, you're making a lot of decisions. A lot of them are unconscious, but you've got to make them like right now. Data. <laughs> yeah, we just added a, a, a staff photographer in the spring, Aaron Kirkland, right here. Um, and that was based on data. It was based on the number of assignments. It was based on the hours of overtime that the other four photographers were working and how it was going to kill them if we didn't bring some other people in. That was the biggest thing. And, um, and again, as being a chargeback unit, you can see the, the revenue. It, it was very easy to figure it out. And also, there comes a time, and again, you don't have to be a great math major to figure this out, but if, if you have X amount of people that can only do X amount of work and make so much money, if you had another person, you can make even more. So, and I presented those facts, and, and it finally happened. I mean, again, the university bureaucracy took a while. It took about six months longer than we wanted, but it eventually happened. Yes, a little bit. I wrote, um, uh, for about 12 years, I did a picture story a week. So, and I wrote all the copy for that. And uh, my journalism training started out, I was, uh, I, I was a sports writer, and I wrote sports in college as well as took pictures. So I had that background. And I could write complete sentences with right punctuation. So <laughs> a lot of photographers can't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I spent a lot of time reading the AP style book, just at night going home and just looking it over. And, and because again, I didn't know it inside or out. And, and I always had editors. When I was a photographer, there was a copy editor and a production editor that was, you know, looking at things before I made something really stupid mistake in the paper. And that never happened, but, um, you know, <laughs> early on I realized that reading and writing were the two key elements to any sort of advancement in whatever job you wanted to do. And so, um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time, I mean, I, I read a lot, I read a lot of different things all the time. and. Um, had done a lot of writing, a lot of creative writing in college, and so that was, that was part of it. That's a good question, and I would say the, 
I'll take somebody with 50% of the talent and 100% of the teamwork, the networking, the person that's going to blend in. I can coach up that, that 50% of the talent. If you're an asshole, I can't make you better. <laughs> it's just impossible. So that's the biggest thing. I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> you're an asshole. <laughs> Anything Thanks, else? Roger. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs>